Good evening and welcome to our panel discussion on the importance of an independent judiciary. Tonight, we hope you'll learn more about how our courts work, the roles of judges, and how to choose good judicial candidates when voting in our upcoming March 5th election and beyond. I'm Michelle Moritz, co-vice president of voter services for the League of Women Voters of San Francisco. The League of Women Voters is a century old nonpartisan political organization that never supports or opposes candidates or parties. But after thorough study and consensus, we do take positions on issues that are important to our community. We provide voter services such as candidate forums, voter registration drives, and events to educate the public on ballot issues. We are proud to co-sponsor tonight's event with the American Constitution Society and the San Francisco Bar Association, whose Deputy Executive Director, Lisa Handley, is here with us and will also say a few words. Lisa? Thank you, Michelle. My name is Lisa Hanley, and I am the Executive Deputy Director of the Bar Association of San Francisco, otherwise known as BASIF. Thank you all for joining us this evening. BASIF sends you all a very warm welcome. I want to start by thanking the League of Women Voters for inviting BASIF to partner with them on this very important program. We know that knowledge is power. No matter the breadth of our career and our experience or how old we are, there should always be the desire and the space for us to learn more and grow in our thinking. That is what this evening's program is about. There are people who are joining us tonight who have never entered a courtroom. There are people here who have never met a lawyer or a judge. And there are lawyers on this call who still stand to learn about the processes and paths to becoming a judge, rules about what judges can and cannot do under the rules, that is the canons, that govern their work. Why is voting in judicial elections important? The judicial branch is the third branch of government that interprets our laws that are put into place by our legislature. Judges preside over cases that involve everyday citizens like you and me. And when there is a dispute, such as in small claims court, in housing, landlord tenant matters, family law, probate, criminal, business disputes, and personal injury matters, just to name a few. We want our judges who decide these very important matters in our lives to be experienced, able and willing to consistently look at the facts and apply the law in making decisions, able and willing not to be influenced by politics and our public opinion, have sound judicial temperament, and able to transcend personal biases. BASIF has always been committed to making sure that lawyers who are appointed or elected to be a judge have these qualifications. The public and all litigants deserve this. Tonight's program is meant to demystify the judicial elections process, how judges get assigned to certain courtrooms once they are sworn in, how a sitting judge who is running for re-election must campaign differently than lawyers who are running for election and differently than other elected officials. I think we all agree that voting is core to our democracy. Three strong branches of government are core to our democracy. Your belief in our democracy is likely what brought you here tonight. Thank you all for wanting to learn more and growing more as a voter in San Francisco and beyond. It is now my pleasure to introduce you to our moderator tonight, Mary McNamara. In addition to being an incredibly brilliant thinker and orator, and a person who is always determined to engage in improving our world, Mary is a past president of BASIF and the Justice and Diversity Center from 2022, and is a named partner of, of the firm Swanson & McNamara, where she primarily practices criminal law. Over to you, Mary. Thank you very much, Lisa. That's very gracious. Um, we're going to jump in very shortly here, and I just want to let everybody know that there's a Q&A uh, that we'd invite people to participate in. This is your chance to ask a, a really impressive array of judges questions that you've been wanting to ask about judicial elections. Let me introduce our esteemed panel. It's my privilege to introduce uh, Judge Lodoris Hazard Cordell. Uh, she was the first African-American woman to sit on a superior court in Northern California. I remember when she was appointed. Uh, she was appointed in Santa Clara, uh, and she's the award-winning uh, memoirist of the book, Her Honor, My Life on the Bench, What Works, What's Broken, and How to Change It. A very timely book for the current situation. Uh, we have Justice Terry Jackson, uh, the first African-American woman to serve as presiding justice of the first appellate district, where she is right now in Division 5. 
Justice Jackson has served on several uh, important statewide committees, such as the pretrial detention work group, uh, which resulted in a fairer risk versus money uh, based system of release and detention. And, and her expertise on these issues, I think, are going to come into play uh, in the discussion today. Next, we have Judge Lillian Singh retired. Um, she was the first Af uh, Asian American woman to serve as a judge of the Superior Court of the County of San Francisco and one of the longest serving members of that court. Uh, Judge Singh started the first drug court for San Francisco County and served on its domestic violence court. She's a founding member of Chinese Affirmative Action, the Meihua Bilingual School, and the Rape of Nanking Redress Coalition. She served as chair of the California Asian American Judges Association. And finally, we have Judge Erica Yu, the first Asian American Pacific Islander to serve uh, as a Superior Court Judge of Santa Clara County. Uh, she is the current chair of the California Judges Association, and Judge Yu has served on various statewide committees focused on ethics, access, and fairness within the judicial system. Welcome, everybody. Um, if I may, I'd just like to get, dispense right now with the technical requirements for being a judge. And if I could turn to uh, Judge Yu, do you mind describing for us, Judge Yu, what the qualifications are to be a judge of the Superior Court and how long the term is that the judge would serve? Of course, thank you so much for having me here. Thank you to the League of Women Voters and to the Bar Association of San Francisco and Ms. McNamara. I'm actually the first female Asian American judge on our court. There were definitely males before me. And I'm currently the, the president of the California Judges Association. I'm the sixth woman to lead the association since 1926. Um, so our terms are six years for trial court judges. And I understand the discussion tonight is really gonna focus on superior court judges. And the qualification is one must be a lawyer in California for 10 years. And so sometimes people have practice elsewhere and they wanna apply for the bench, but you have to have been a lawyer in California for 10 years. And that's a requirement stated in our constitution. Thank you very much. Um, one other th quirk of our system is that although California has a judicial election system, most judges in California are actually appointed by the governor. Um, could we discuss why that is and what the system really is intended to do? And are there any flaws in our current system of having an appointment based system, but elections sometimes? Justice Jackson. Yes, it's in our constitution again that the governor can appoint. Through the appointment process, it goes through a very rigorous vetting system. In every area of the state, you have this committee called JSAC. And Judge you, you know what JSAC stands for. It's Judicial uh, Applicant Selection. Judicial Selection Advisory Committee. And one can find the members on the governor's website. So www.gov.ca.gov. You deal with these acronyms so often, you just don't remember what they stand for. So you go through that vetting process of JSAC. And from there, you go, your application is then um, uh, goes through a process called our Jenny Commission, which that is an evaluation process. It's very rigorous. They send out questionnaires on every applicant, not only in your county that you're trying to be appointed to, but throughout the state. Give us information about this person. And through that process, and it's pretty rigorous, then and only then does the appointment secretary look to see whether or not the person has no, one, um, have not had any complaints with the state bar, two, if you're going to be elevated, no complaints with the Commission on Judicial Performance, and three, if this person has the right temperament, the ability to understand and learn and so forth. But why do we have the election process there? It was designed, and my colleagues can jo um, join me on this, it was designed to ensure that, say for instance, you have a judge without the right temperament, a judge who is not following the law, a judge who um, shows bias in the courtroom, not quite rising to the level of being um, disciplined, but nevertheless is there and it, that person is not being fair and impartial. That gives the voters the right to say, look, this is not the type of judge that we want, not because of their political beliefs, 
not because of the political tides, but it's based upon they're not meeting the basic minimum qualifications to be a judge in the state of California. And fortunately, okay. very few of our judges ever get challenged because they are, they're making their decisions impartially and fairly. Is there anything wrong about challenging a sitting judge? I mean, and for reasons that are different from the ones you just described, Justice Jackson, which is incompetence or, or poor judicial temperament. What about if you just don't agree with the way a judge approaches a specific set of cases, for example? Well, or we if you think that judges have been appointed by the governor and they're predominantly from one group, like it's all white men, would that be an appropriate basis to challenge a sitting judge? Are you asking me or just uh, Judge Cordell? Uh, both of you, whoever wants to take that question. Sure, I can jump in right now if, if that's okay. Um, Please. Again, thank you for, for inviting us all to participate and thank all the attendees. Um, so Article 6, Section 16 of the California Constitution authorizes judicial elections. Uh, and just as a quick bit of history, um, before the late 1700s, uh, judges were uh, all appointed by, by governors. And then Mississippi became the very first state to have the election of judges. And they had elections for their lower court judges. Uh, and then by the late 1800s, just about every then territory of the states had judicial elections. So there, there, there's a, a history there. Again, we're talking about the state court judges. Um, so in California, as it was noted, most judges are appointed appointed by the governor after a vetting process. That's, that's pretty uh, extensive and intense. Um, however, every single judge who was appointed only has a term of up to six years. And I say up to because some judges get appointed to fill out a term of a judge who maybe has retired out, would only have three years left, and then would have to then start another six-year term. And so every single judge whose term is up, who wants to remain on the bench, is subject to, one, being challenged by someone, but has to be reelected. So if no one challenges a judge whose six-year term is up, then that judge's name will be on the ballot, but there will be no opposition. So if the judge just votes for herself, she's elected in. Uh, so that's basically it. So judicial elections really hit everybody at one way or another. Um, I had uh, the experience of first being appointed to the bench, and then um, at this was a time before when we had two trial courts. We had municipal court and a superior court. They were consolidated in the late 1990s. So I was appointed to the municipal court, but then there was an opening, a vacancy on the superior court, and I chose to run for that seat, and someone else ran for that seat, so it was a contested election. Um, so I, and, and given all of that, I, I, first I will tell you, I'm absolutely opposed to judicial elections. Um, and the reason I'm opposed is that people tend to think that judges are just politicians because politicians run for election and judges and politicians are very different. What is the difference? Politicians uh, make promises to their constituents to do whatever it is their constituents want. And that's fine. That's what politicians do. But the only promise that a judge can make is to uphold the law. Politics should never, must never enter into it. Uh, so what we have are some people who want to be judges and, and they're wanting to be a judge. They will then challenge a judge who's already, whose term mm -hmm. may be up, who wants to stay on, but wants to be challenged, but, but will be challenged. Uh, so that's the, the last question that you asked, Mary, about you know, what's, is there a problem with challenging a judge? Well, as long as we have judicial elections, which I'm opposed to, um, that, that, that is clearly an opportunity to do that. The problem, of course, is the person who's challenging has never been vetted. There's somebody who just decides, who knows? They could have had coffee that morning and decided, you know what? I think I want to be a judge now. I've put in my 10 years as a lawyer, and let me see, who can I pick? Uh, I'll probably pick somebody who's very vulnerable, and what does that mean? It could mean uh, I'll just pick a woman or I'll pick someone of color or I'll pick somebody who's gay, somebody who I think is vulnerable. <laughs> That's the problem that I have with challenges. Uh, if 
it is a judge who is doing her job, doing applying the law, like Justice Jackson said, just doing the work. And for someone to just pick on them and say, yep, I think I want your spot. Uh, I don't believe that's how the judiciary should work. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Judge Cordell. I see a couple of, of three hands up, but I, I want to make just one observation here. Um, the vetting process, which uh, Justice Jackson spoke about, and you just referenced uh, Judge Cordell uh, as being crucial, um, the Bar Association does vet people who are challengers, who <laughs> are not sitting judges, but people who want to assume that seat in a challenged election. This Bar Association uh, vets everybody uh, who participates and the two sitting judges who are up for uh, a challenge uh, have been vetted and they both received uh, the qualification of well-qualified. Unfortunately, their challengers did not participate and so we were unable to rate them. And I would like to turn uh, to Judge Singh, you've got your, your hand up, and just if you could explain in some detail to, to the public here what is that vetting process that the Bar Association goes through? What does the Bar Association look for? And why is this important and helpful data for the public to have? Before I answer that question, I'd like to comment on what Judge Cordell said about um, challenging judges. I also am very skeptical of judicial elections challenges. However, I will not go as far as Judge Cordell to say, I never think it's a good idea. For instance, in our court, there was a judge by name of, um, uh, who was the first lesbian woman judge to challenge a sitting judge. At that time, come on, help me. What's her name? Um, Donna everybody. Hitchens. Uh, Donna, Donna Hitchens. Hitchens. Donna Hitchens. Hired. Mm -hmm. When she ran, we were, the sitting judges were very conflicted. On the one hand, at that time, we did not have a lesbian woman on the Superior Court. I happened to support uh, the sitting judge at that time because I worked with her for a long, long time. And I supported Dorothy Otalassim. I can't remember her last name. Von Berardin. Von Berardinger. But the court was very split as to whom the court wants to support, whether Donna Hitchens or Dorothy Van Berardinger. Donna Hitchens won, and she became a very good judge. She was she, she was a very, very good judge. Now, that's just a rare situation, but she felt she needed to run because she felt her community was not represented in the judiciary. I'll come back to myself. I was the first Asian-American woman judge in Northern California, not just San Francisco, because at that time, there was just nobody like I on the bench. And when I told people I was a judge, I would get remarks like, you don't look like a judge. At that time, most judges were white males. One time I was in the cafeteria in our court waiting to get some lunch. And the guy behind me said, do you speak English? Asked me. Yes, yeah, I said, I do. What's your question? <laughs> he asked me a question, I answered it. The next thing I know, I was in court and my bailiff says, all right, the Honorable Judge Lillian Singh presiding. He was among the public. I could see his mouth drop. So those are the situations where representation of the community is really, really important. So there are exceptions to challenging sitting judges, but they're very, very rare. And when that happens, it is a very difficult process. Like right now, the election, the, there's a contested election. Now, in terms of vetting candidates, I think everybody should be vetted by the San Francisco Bar Association because that is one way to tell the public who these candidates are. Who vets the judges except the San Francisco Bar Association? Most people don't know who their judges are. Most people don't go to court unless they have to go to court. So unfortunately, a lot of judges don't get an opportunity to meet the public, to engage with the public, so the public know who their judges are. And I tell you, I've always told my colleagues, you better go to your community 
and better get involved in your community because the community is the people that you are serving. We are servants of the community. So when you, I think the vetting process of the San Francisco Bar Association, coming back to your question, is extremely important. And I think those who do not submit themselves to vetting by the San Francisco Bar Association are cowards. They're afraid that their uh, qualifications will be examined by the Bar Association. You have to be examined by a professional organization to help the public understand who you are and what kind of qualifications you have. Unfortunately, I looked at the last um, Bar Association's evaluation of the candidates. We had um, three openings in our San Francisco Superior Court, and we had, I think, six candidates. The Bar Association evaluated one person is exceptionally well qualified. She's a very well known district attorney, Ms. Rani Singh. She did not get elected. The other person that the Bar Association evaluated is well qualified, Dorothy Proudfoot. She did not get elected. The three people that got elected were just qualified. So I don't know. The Bar Association evaluation is important, but how they get translated to the public so the public can utilize that information is really another issue. But to answer okay. your question, yes, it is very important for candidates to be vetted by the San Francisco Bar Association. Thank you, Judge Singh. Uh, uh, Judge Yu, I think you had your hand up. Yes, thank you. Well, first of all, I also was the president of the California Asian Pacific American Bar Association. And we know that, as Judge Cordell said, there are judges who are sitting judges who have a, a name that's not a standard Western surname, who are specifically challenged because they're perceived to be weak because their name is not a Western name. And we have had people ask challengers of Asian American judges, why are you running against this particular judge? And, and the lawyers have said, because of their last name, and I think I can win. But going to your question about sort of the vetting process, there's two different processes. What Judge Singh was talking about was in an election process, it's wonderful that the Bar Association of San Francisco vets candidates, but that's one county of 58 counties and there's multiple counties where there is no Bar Association that does any vetting. So then as Judge Cordell said, in an election, it's just people who have the funds and can get the signatures and, and the desire to run for the judgeship. And uh, so I also was chair of the, uh, the Commission on Judicial Performance, which is a constitutionally mandated body started in 1960. It has a sole uh, responsibility and um, authority to remove judges and discipline them. Um, and so they've done some really interesting data research and they did a 20 year survey, which looked at all the various different discipline of various different judges based on you know how long they'd been a judge, et cetera. And they found that judges who are elected are unfortunately disciplined at a higher rate than judges who are appointed. Because judges who are appointed go through a different qualification process than Judge Singh talked about. They go through vetting by the um, group that Justice Jackson talked about, which is the Judicial Selection Advisory Committee, who are lawyers of uh, judges and justices of high standing with great reputations selected by the governor to be an advisory group. The candidates who apply also go through vetting by the California State Bar. Um, and the State Bar sends out sometimes 700 or more written questionnaires about an applicant for a trial court, superior court position, or an appellate justice. And they go to all the judges in the jurisdiction where the person's applying to be appointed, um, as well as opponents, you know, just colleagues. So lots of people get to weigh in. And then... Hey, I'm sorry to interrupt. Also throughout the state. Throughout the state. Correct. Yes. Thank you, Justice Jackson. And then the Bar Association will collect any negative comments that seem to be substantiated and actually ask the candidate about that in an interview. 
So there's really a lot more vetting. And then some counties like San Francisco and Santa Clara have a contract with the governor's office to receive their nomination of the judge's application to vet as well on a county level. But not all counties do that. It used to be, I believe it was San Diego that did not want to do that because they didn't want to take sides and offend people. So there are certain counties that don't have that vetting on that level. But what is also something that's extraordinarily different in a application process versus an election process is the actual PDQ, personal data questionnaire, which is the application that the um, person who is seeking the office must fill out. And that also is on the governor's website if people would like to see it. My application ended up being 33 pages long because basically you're asked everything, including have you ever done anything that if appointed would embarrass the governor? So, I mean, basically when I went through the process, I received a letter that had my credit history from the age of 18 to 40, because I applied at 40. So that vetting process is very rigorous, very extensive. And you can see why judges who are elected are generally, according to 20 years of, of California judicial performance data, they're disciplined at a higher rate than judges who are appointed. So thank you. They look at every one of your cases and they re, um, review it. How many times have you been reversed? And everyone gets reversed. But on what grounds? Was it misconduct? Was it the fact that you didn't understand the law? And what we also have to remember, yes, a judge may sit in a particular county, but a superior court for the state of California can sit in any county. That's why we're vetted throughout the state. When I was um, appointed to San Francisco Superior Court bench, another county in Riverside had a backlog that was over the top. It was um, something that they had to take care of. I was reassigned as a Superior Court judge to go and sit in Riverside for six months. So therefore the whole vetting process ensures that a judge a person who is appointed to be a judge can sit anywhere, hear any type of case and handle it fairly and partially and will do um, uphold the Constitution of the United States and California Constitution. So there's a little bit difference here why the vetting process will ensure that they will have, I hate to say it, the best and the brightest or those who are striving to be the best and the brightest. Okay, thank you. I think so. We we've, we've aired this question of the difference between, shall we say, the appointed cohort um, of judges who go through the statewide mandated rigorous uh, process of vetting, um, and the challengers, the people who put themselves up as a, a, an electoral prospect against a sitting judge who don't have that statewide apparatus, although in San Francisco, our bar associations does vet those challengers, but there, that is a, a fairly big distinction. I want to I want to now come to this question, and I'd like to draw on your expertise here, uh, Justice Jackson, as a former presiding judge in, in San Francisco, of what happens when somebody is either appointed by the governor or is elected to fill a seat? Where does that judge go? There are many different departments in San Francisco. And one one thing I think that has come up in this election is there's been criticism of, you know, bail um, uh, decisions. And even if the uh, challengers are elected and defeat the sitting judges, are is there any guarantee that they're going to get a criminal assignment, for example, and, and will be able to carry out their vision of of how criminal law should be dispensed? No. Um, the reason I say no is because, one, you have to look at the needs of the court to see if there's a need in a particular assignment. Also, you have to look at the skill sets. When someone just becomes a judge, there's a certain amount of training that needs to take place. And when you are a judge, you are not a specialty judge. You're a superior court judge who says that he or she can handle any type of case that can be handled. Typically, a newly appointed judge will or elected will go to an assignment where they learn judicial temperament. So they may be in a courtroom or handle cases such as um, traffic, where you have to deal with a high volume of cases and you're dealing with the public. That trains you on being able to handle a high volume caseload, which will happen if you happen to be in a civil courtroom or in a criminal courtroom. And you learn how to talk to the people who are coming before you. Um, one of the things that most courts throughout the state, 
will do as a presiding judge will do out throughout the state. For instance, if you happen to be appointed or elected out of the public defender's office or out of the DA's office, there is an appearance of conflict or could be a conflict of interest. So typically those who are coming out of the DA's office or the public defender's office, they're not going to get a criminal assignment because a lot of the cases that are going to be coming into the criminal courtroom will be cases that they've either handled, heard about, or have some knowledge and supervise that particular person. So you try to distance the person so that there won't be any conflict. That happens with people who have a family law um, background because it's a specialty bar. Again, you try to assign that person to a courtroom where there won't be any conflict, won't be any challenges. And more importantly, we have taken the oath to be judges and that we can sit on any assignment where there is a need. So if a person is um, recently appointed or elected, they will go where there is a need in the courtroom, not because they have a certain expertise. And if I could just add one thing to that is that when judges are challenged, when you have people who are not judges, they're lawyers who want to be, they generally tend to run on this like a one issue. So currently the issue is I'm going to be tough on crime. And when I'm on the bench, I'm going to, you know, really let people know that I'm not going to set bail. Well, there is no guarantee that that person is ever going to sit in a criminal assignment, at least maybe the next, the first three, four years. When I uh, was elected to the Superior Court in Santa Clara County, I spent my first three years in family court. So there's no guarantee. So when someone says, this is what I'm going to do, that's not what judges do. That's one of the things we do. But there are many, many more probate, adoptions, mental health, drug court, all of those things. And challengers tend not to focus on any of that stuff at all. It's based on the court's need. As a presiding judge, I looked at what do I need? Who has the skill sets for this particular assignment? And who will not be in a conflict where they're going to get challenged by one side or the other? There's a lot of things that go into it. And if you're a new judge, however, you do not start a new judge off on a homicide case. And, I, you know, I was a former head of homicide. I did not, my first cases dealt with misdemeanor trials. I did small claims. I did traffic. Again, that was a training process. And then, of course, we have training for judges where they go off to new judges um, orientation as well as judges college. But this whole idea that, oh, if I get elected as a judge and I'm a family practitioner, I'm gonna be doing family law. That is not the case because there is no judge, no judge should ever have a feat them. Every judge should be capable of handling any assignment given the proper training and the court's needs. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So, uh, you know, all of us are required to comport and comply with the canon of ethics. We must adhere to that. Otherwise, it's misconduct. And the canons require us to not prejudge a situation and to always be neutral, listen to all sides and be fair. So the danger is when a, an um, candidate is running, saying, I'm going to be tough on crime, I'm going to be tough on crime. They're essentially prejudging situations. And also, the United States has gone through a lot of changes. I'm on the National Center for State Courts Board, for example. There's so much empirical information that is so different than when I became a judge in 1985. And that um, applies to bail reform, to treatment courts, to mental health courts. I mean, the National Center just spent several years on a national basis looking at mental health, looking at fentanyl addiction, looking at deaths related to fentanyl and other drug use, and putting out guidelines lines for states throughout the country in terms of what courts should do, what what changes in mindset the court should um, consider, and sort of different sentencing, different bail guidelines. So if one is running, sort of prejudging a situation, it sort of seems to indicate that they are unaware of the empirical data that's now available to us and unaware of the growth and the trends that are happening nationally. And as a judge, you, you can't just go in and, and say, I'm going to do something because you have to fit in with everyone else as well. And what's the law is you have to follow the law. And, and being the sole person there who's not following the law, not following the trends, not, you know, following the guidelines, I mean, would be really quite dangerous for everybody. Let me stay with you, Judge you on, the, on this point, because one of the challenged judges, Judge Begert, uh, is in the CARE Act court. 
Um, you know, it's, as we just have heard from uh, Justice Jackson, there is no guarantee that if Judge Beggert were defeated in the election, that his challenger would go into that court. But can you tell us how the CARE Act court works? First of all, is it a criminal court? And second of all, what what's it there for? Sure. And I have two monitors, so I'm sorry I'm not looking at this screen. I'm going to look at the other screen that I have um, care court information on. San Francisco has a wonderful website, San Francisco Superior Court, which is specifically about the CARE Act Court. Our county calls it CARE Court. San Francisco calls it the CARE Act Court. Um, and so if the people go to sf.courts.ca.gov, they can find the CARE Act Court page. CARE Act is the Community Assistance, Recovery, and an Empowerment Act. The CARE Act seeks to provide mental health services, support, and accountability for Californians living with untreated schizophrenia and other psychotic disorders. The act aims to divert and prevent restrictive conservatorships or incarcerations through a court order care plan or court-approved care agreement for up to 12 months that is initiated via a petition through the courts. This is not seated in a criminal division. It was not intended to be a criminal court matter. It was intended to be civil, and most courts are putting it in a probate setting. The Judicial Council actually just received a statewide report on January 19th about care courts, and interestingly, there have been 220 applications throughout the state. And in Orange County, one third of like 30% of the applications or petitions have been by the by the people who are seeking it themselves, the people who need it. And this is mandated now. This is something that Governor Newsom wanted to see put in place. There's um, some discussion about funding. So judges are required to, to implement the care court and to provide these resources and, and this care for people in our various counties. Uh, there's been a cohort of courts that started, San Francisco being one of the first adopters. But by December of 2024, every county superior court is required to have a care court in place operating to serve people. And these people are people who are the neediest of people. These people are the ones that have ended up in jail, incarcerated over and over because there's been no other alternative in our society. I mean, Santa Clara is like that too. There's very few locked facilities. We don't have enough treatment beds. And often people are arrested in a sort of revolving door situation because they're not well and they commit crimes that end up having them in custody. They cannot afford bail. There's no treatment facility for them to go to. And so they're just sitting in custody. And we had a famous case in which someone who was in court in court and then in jail because he was mentally ill waiting, waiting for a bed was killed in custody by deputies who were not really trained to know how to treat that situation. So it's just a lose-lose for everyone. And while care court is new and there are people who are sort of wondering how it's gonna be implemented and every county has the option to implement it in various different permutations, it is something that it gives people hope that there's something our society can do in a much more humane way to treat people with really significant mental health issues um, rather than incarcerating them. Okay, thank you. And, and uh, Justice Jackson, I'd like to ask you a question about the other sitting judge, uh, Judge Patrick. Can I, can, can I can I respond to add to what Please. you just said? In terms Please, of judge care me. court, you can just feel what Judge Yu just said about the court. What kind of people come to that court? Therefore, you have to ask yourself, what kind of a judge would be good in that court? Is it somebody who? doesn't understand anything about mental health, doesn't understand anything about drug addictions, does not understand anything about homeless issues, has no, is isolated in terms of um, what's going on in San Francisco. You know, this is why judges, in terms of uh, the presiding judge, appointing a particular judge to sit in a particular court, you have to make sure the judge would understand these human issues, not so much legal issues, human issues that inflict and affect people. Judge Beggett's kindness and consideration, I, by the way, I sat in this court. I'm also a um, retired judge, but I go on uh, assignment into being a judge. 
and I sit at his court constantly. And the, you really require a lot of patience, then you cannot be judgmental. So in terms of judicial temperament, we sort of talked about it and skirted around it. That is one of the most important qualification of being a judge, is do you have the judicial temperament to listen carefully, to understand the issues before you. And these challenges are criticizing the sitting judges because they're not tough enough on crime. They're pre, again, I'm gonna say another thing, and that is we are looking at judges this way. The litigants has, have the right to challenge a judge just based on what a 170.6 of the penal code, which is, I don't want you to be my judge. I just don't feel you can be fair. So these judges come before litigants and they're already saying, I'm gonna to be tough on crime. You think that any public defender wants to have that person to be a judge in his or her court? No, so that judge will most likely not be hearing criminal court because it will be challenged by most defense attorneys. Yeah, let me let me just make that underline that point. I think it's a very important point, Judge Singh, which is if if a judge is perceived by an institutional player like the public defender or the DA's office as being more on one side than the other, then those offices en masse can boycott that judge and essentially yes. the judge isn't capable of proceeding. That's under existing law. I'd like to turn now, we've, we've talked about the care court, and I'd like to turn just briefly to the other judge who's who's being challenged, Judge Thompson, and to understand what kind of court he sits in and what kind of uh, issues are decided in that court. And and Judge da Justice Jackson, do you mind covering that issue too? I'll try my best. I believe he is, he is sitting in a um, preliminary hearing court. And as of um, in December 31st, 2023, 31st, um, the preliminary hearing court did not hear bail or detention cases. Only after they heard the evidence, they make a determination whether um, bail should remain or the person should be uh, detained. Um, but that is a case of probable cause, whether or not the person, uh, there's probable cause to believe that a person has committed a felony. And that is hit, that's what a preliminary hearing judge their assignment is. Now, I believe they've gone back to doing arraignments. I'm not sure, but if they are, they're arraigning um, uh, people who are arrested for felony cases, and then they hear the preliminary hearing in the afternoon. So it's a okay. different thing. Um, I have done a preliminary hearing assignment, and I did it for two years. And there were occasions after hearing the evidence, one, I found that there was no felony committed, or two, that the case, I had to adjust bail. There, it, um, at that time, we did bail. And uh, I may say that bail should be increased because there are more charges to the offense. Or I will say the case is not as serious as what was represented at the time of arraignment. Now that we've heard the evidence, bail should be reduced down appropriately. But that's his assignment. And um, I believe he's still in that assignment. Okay, yes. thank you. Um, yes. It's important, I think, to understand where these judges are sitting and what kind of issues they're tackling. And from what I'm gathering, uh, Justice Jackson, it seems like although just Judge Thompson can hear bail petitions, it's not where those things typically get decided. No. Uh, they get decided at an earlier point in, in the proceedings. Could I ask you just a quick question? I, I, I thought I misheard something, but I'm not sure. Uh, did you say that the two lawyers who are challenging the judges declined to be interviewed by the Bar Association and therefore were not vetted not by them? Yes, they, they have not responded to our requests that they participate okay. in the vetting process. Right. Yes. So to me, and I hope people listening, that is very significant. If they are declining to be vetted, uh, to be, have questions asked, looking at experience, why they're running, and they've absolutely declined and not been a part of it, that is a major difference, again, between the judges who are now sitting in those seats who were vetted and who not just by the Bar Association. So um, I, I think it's very significant. And that raises for me, I have no idea why someone who wants to be a judge would not want, want to be vetted by the Bar Association. Um, let me let me actually, uh, it's a good segue. 
sorry, to the point I wanted to turn back to you on, uh, Judge Cordell, which is in a contested election scenario, which is where we are right now, um, challengers make statements about what they might envision uh, as their you know, intentions when they become judges if they're elected. And sometimes what challengers say is critical of uh, the sitting judge. What, if anything, can the sitting judge do to respond? And, and has that power to respond changed in any way over the course of the years? Before 2018, judges had, sitting judges had no right of self-defense. And by that, I mean that if a judge's decision uh, was criticized by someone, particularly somebody who wanted to have that judge's job, the judge was not permitted by the judicial canons. And they're just, there are rules that judges have to abide by in California. Judges were not permitted to speak about any pending cases. So if the, the criticism was about a decision the judge made um, and there was the case was still pending, and that could mean they already sentenced somebody, but that person's on probation. As long as the person's on probation, the case is pending. They cannot talk. So there was no right of self-defense, and judges had to rely on others, surrogates, to speak up for them. And many people in the public saw that as not understanding that judges were not allowed to speak, thought, well, the judge isn't saying anything. They, they must uh, be... The, the criticism must be accurate. That's why they're being quiet. No, that was not the case. After, in 2018, after the recall of Aaron Persky, the judicial canon was amended or revised to allow judges some self-defense when their decisions have been criticized in the public. Uh, it's a very narrow kind of self-defense, but it, it's take, it is a step that allows judges to speak up for themselves. Uh, and this came about, Aaron Persky was recalled, and during the time he was recalled, again, about one case, he was not allowed to speak. Uh, so that therein was a major problem. And I think that had he been able to speak, uh, perhaps he might not have been recalled. But that, be that as it may, uh, the rules have now changed since then. And uh, so there is a limited ability of judges to be able to speak up for themselves when they are unjustly criticized for decisions they've made. And okay. I'd, like to, I'd like to say and what we can can't just, speak just, just Cordell said about not allowed. When Judge Cordell said not allowed, it means we judges have a commission on judicial performance that watches us. If we do something that violates the canons of the Code of Judicial Conduct, the commission on judicial performance will come after us and will discipline us. So when Judge Cordell says we're not allowed to say something, we have to conform to the code of judicial conduct, and we at any way somehow deviate from that, even very minor, the code of judicial, uh, the commission of judicial performance will come after me and will discipline you, either publicly censoring you or even to the extent of removing you from being a judge. So it's very, very serious. I, I, I I know I Judge, just wanted to share that with you. I know Judge Yu wants to speak on this because she was the chair of the commission. But even when we're allowed to speak, we have to be very general. We okay. cannot say, I would do it differently. You can explain and give the basis in which you have made a decision if there's a cr criticism. But again, our hands are not wide open where we can go into the merits of the case. J Judge Yu, I'm sure you want to clarify some things. Yes. Well, first, I wanted to ask Mary if you wanted me to share slides, because I have those two canons that Judge Cordell talked about. And it explains please. that. OK, so I'll share slide, uh, share screen at this point. Um, and please let me know if it works and you can. Sh Oops, I'm sorry. Can you share my can you see the screen? Does we it, can. Is it, my, is it the PowerPoint slides? It's it's the canon uh, 3B9. Good. Yes. So if you can see here, canon 3B9 talks about the fact that the premise is a judge shall not make public comment about a pending or impending proceeding. But in connection to a judicial election or recall campaign, the canon does not prohibit a judge from making public comment about a pending proceeding provided, and that must be two things, 
First, that the comment would not reasonably be expected to affect the outcome or impair the fairness of the proceeding. And second, that the comment is about a procedural, factual, or legal basis of a decision. And so really the premise is we're not supposed to talk about a pending case because we always have to ensure that the perception and the reality is that judges are neutral and fair. That's critical to public trust and confidence and judicial independence. But this exception was carved out, as Justice as Judge Cordell said, because um, there was a realization when Judge Persky was going through the recall that th there was a lack of fairness for judges who were being recalled. They, they, we still have some First Amendment rights and we should be able to say something in our defense. However, there is a um, we have the canons and then there is a Supreme Court committee which reviews the canons, gives advice to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court promulgates the canons that we must all adhere to as judges and justices. But that committee that advises the Supreme Court gives us commentary that helps us understand what the canon says and gives us sort of advice. So it's it's just what Judge Jackson said, actually. This commentary says that the provision which allows a judge to make public comment about a pending decision that's the subject of criticism in an election campaign um, applies to all judicial elections. It doesn't have to be a recall. But See, the advice is, depending upon the circumstances, the judge sh should consider whether it may be preferable for a third party rather than the judge to respond, because sometimes people can be misheard, they may be misinformed, judges... We trip up on ourselves as well. We don't always say things that are completely accurate. And so that's where we do um, need other judges, lawyers, and people who could help us speak to the public and, and let the public know why we believe or the candidate believes that that recall is unfair. I did answer one of the questions in the QA and A about the Commission on Judicial Performance. Now you can um, make complaints about a judge regarding misconduct um, that is either online, you can put the complaint online, which is new, or you can send in something in writing. Um, the complaints are always kept confidential unless the matter proceeds to a formal proceeding. So there's about 1,100 to 1,200 complaints a year against judges. Last year was like 1,400, so it was higher than normal. And oh, maybe about two or three one to two, go to a formal proceeding each year. So unless it's in a formal proceeding, the complainant's name is never given up. So you as a lawyer, judge, litigant, you have confidentiality when you complain about a judge. And I think that's really important. Um, I don't like to hear people say that the commission goes after people because having been on it for nine years and knowing it, the commission doesn't really go after people. The commission acts like a judge. They try to be in the middle. They try to listen to the complaints. They do an investigation. And then they make a decision as to whether the judge committed misconduct or not and what the level of discipline should be. There are multiple levels. One is the judge can be privately um, disciplined. They can be privately admonished, publicly admonished, or censured or removed. I can tell you having, I, I realized recently having done a teaching on ethics that I, I processed over 10,000 complaints against judges, commissioners, and justices. When judges come before the commission, the judges take it seriously. I mean, they're crying, they're upset, they're really um, taking it seriously. And so the lawyers and the public may say, well, a censure, what does that, what kind of discipline is that, but judges take it to heart, particularly when it's public. All of us know, and you know, it's almost like that person has this thing following them for the rest of their career. Thank you, Mary. Thank you. And and you've addressed, I think, the the uh, apparatus for, for determining if there's been misconduct, some 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 bad behavior by the judge. There was a question earlier in the QA about well, what happens when there's just a legal error? Uh, what are the remedies for a judge making a mistake? Can anybody That's comment me. on that? Or if that's you, Justice Jackson, right. That's what I do. I mean, I look at the transcripts to determine whether that judge's decision should be affirmed or reversed. And if um, if it's if someone disagrees, then they take it to the California Supreme Court. So, yes, there are errors there. Um, but the question is, is the error uh, so prejudicial that it impacts the outcome of the case? 
And that's what we look at. So there is a check and balance even within our judicial system. You have the trial right. court judge who makes the decisions and the case goes on to the Court of Appeal, which the Court of Appeal, where I sit in the first district, we hear every case that is going to be appealed. And then we make our decisions. And ultimately, if you want to, um, you challenge the Court of Appeal and take it up to the Supreme Court, they have the right to grant the petition whether or not to hear the case. And failing all of that, uh, the public has the right to move to change the law, right? Um, that's also a right under our democratic system. You know, I had a, a, a case that I handled, and it was not a popular decision, but it was the right decision. And, of course, the law was changed by the legislators. It didn't mean my decision was wrong. In fact, my decision was correct based on the law at that time. But they do have the right, if they don't, uh, unless it's unconstitutional, or discriminatory, then that's a different matter. But if they don't like the outcome and they want it to be a different way, they go to their legislators to change it. Okay, thank you. Uh, there's another interesting question in the Q&A, uh, uh, a technical question, and it's this. When candidates run for one of multiple open seats, do they choose which race they'll run in, or are there geographic or other criteria that determine which office they must run in? Who wants to tackle that? Is that the when you're talking about San Francisco, the the, the C thirteen eleven whatever that's picked by the Department of Election, but you're running in San Francisco, so it would be all the San Franciscans who are registered to vote in this county would um, make a decision on the particular judge. And the candidate can the candidate choose a particular judge though to to run against? Oh, run against. Yes. Definitely. Yes. Definitely. I'm sorry, I, I misunderstood what you meant. Yes, they can. I, I think this is what's happening right now in San Francisco, they chose judges to run because they, I, I, they think they are vulnerable for one, or maybe they, 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 they want to campaign on tough on crime, but they want to have us because some very, very rich people are backing them up, but they do select an individual to run against. It's not just blankly running against all the okay. judges. And if I mean, no, I, I, nobody challenges that person, then the 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 person whose term is up, just the name is not even on the ballot. I, w I would like to say, I'm not sure people know, but, and I know one of the challenges is an Asian female, Asian American female, but both judges who are being challenged are BIPOC, people of color. You know, Judge Thompson identifies, I understand, as a black judge. I met him for the first time at a Kapaja California Asian Pacific American judges event a week or two ago. And Judge Beckert identifies as an Asian American judge and has been very involved in Kapaja, the California Asian Pacific American Judges Association. And Kapaja has supported him. Um, along with several Asian American judges, because um, he has done a lot for the community. Um, he did a lot as a lawyer um, and as a bench officer to support everyone in his community, including those whom he identifies with. Okay. Um, another question from the audience. Um, is there enough funding for the California court system, especially after the pandemic? It seems like there have been long backlogs, uh, this person observes. Now, well, you know, who are we to quibble over it? But, um, it all of the state of California is in deficit right now. So unfortunately, it does impact our courts. And for a long time, and Judge, you and I sat on the California Judicial Council, where our budget was cut um, routinely to the point that as a presiding judge, I had to face, do I... Lay off. I had a 10% budget cut. And do I lay off my the staff, the backbone of our court, or do we as judges and the staff all contribute one day a month of our salary to keep our courts going? So is there enough? Probably not with the increase of demand. But um, I, we also have to keep in mind everybody right now is facing a, a budget cut. And we're trying to do our part, even the judiciary. As the president of the California Judges Association, I'm back sitting on the council for this year. And, um, you know, the judicial budget is not as bad as we thought it would be. Governor Newsom is supportive, but the budget is anticipated to be tough, you know, throughout the state for multiple years. Um, in the past, 
the California judicial budget has has been really dire because it was the one source of funds that the legislature could sweep. So if the the courts didn't use their funds, those funds could be swept. And so being judicious and, and frugal meant that we lost the funding in our courts. But the backlog is related to COVID because courts were closed, is related to budget cuts, but also nationally, um, and I understand internationally, actually, because I just visited my father in a different country and I heard that they had the same issues. It's very hard to hire people these days. Um, and so we don't have enough deputies. So we need the deputies to be able to keep the courts open. We don't have enough court reporters. And that's a that's a national um, concern right now. Um, so then we don't have court reporters so people can have a record. We don't have enough interpreters, which is a statewide issue. So it's it's a combination of a whole bunch of things, which is sort of keeping the backlog in a place where the courts would rather see it not. I mean, we'd rather have no backlog, but there's so many challenges to addressing the backlog. And it's not just the budget, but there's a lot of different things at play. Backlog, we're talking about people. We're talking about those who are incarcerated waiting for a trial. We're talking about people who want to have redress, you know, dealing with their landlord-tenant situation. So we understand backlog. We know it's impacting the people. Hey, uh, another question from the audience. Is the Superior Court funded by the state or the city or a combination? The state. And then we do get, from time to time, federal funding on certain um, positions. But we are state so we, our funding comes from the state. Okay. Um, I'd like to turn to another money question. Before we, we do that, uh, one uh, viewer asked, how many Superior Court judges in San Francisco had their six-year term up this election cycle? If they are unopposed, did you say that their names will also appear in the ballot? I they think their not. names do not appear on, on the they ballot. Do they do not appear on the ballot. No, they do okay. not. Only okay. if you unpost. If yes. I'm not, I, again, I'm not in the Superior Court, but I think there were oh, 50, 52. No, think. no, no, up for election this year. Oh, I think up to for election. I'm yeah, not sure. 12, 15, whatever, I think. Yeah, I'm not. So just, just but, to encapsulate but the two, that again. The only, two, the only two judges' names on the ballot. On the ballot. Judge Daggett and Judge Thompson. They are the only I, two that have been challenged. Challenge, right. But the other so all the, were not challenged. Although the others, yes, are, are, their terms may be up, but because they've not been challenged, their names do not appeal, appear on the ballot and they're deemed to be automatically re-elected at the, at the moment of the general election. Okay. Um, I, I would, uh, there's another very smart question here. Is the press covering judicial elections intelligently raising concerns like these expressed tonight? How would you like to answer that? Anybody? Well, I've seen some, and you know, it, it, you, you have the whole gambit, but I've seen some um, op-eds by some of our major newspapers and some of our local. They seem to understand it and get it. Um, there are people who really want to elect their judges based upon their political beliefs. And will that judge be tough on tenants? Will that person be tough on crime and so forth? And there are some media that kind of supports it. So, but for the most part, what I've seen so far, I think the uh, media is covering it pretty well. I, I would join Judge, Justice Jackson on that. I, I'm very pleased with what I've seen in San Francisco's media in covering this judicial election. I thought the Chronicle was very fair um, in its approach. It gave a very thoughtful, deliberate endorsement of two sitting judges and indicated why. Judge Baggett and Judge Thompson should be re-elected. Uh, it went through a lot. And I thought some of the um, other ethnic newspapers, like the Chinese newspaper, have also covered this issue very much. Because after all, we have 30 some percent Chinese Americans in San Francisco, and many of them are now utilizing the courts. So it's very important to the ethnic communities that good judges are elected. Because after all, who do you want to hear your case? When you go to court, it is so important that you'll get a judge that you feel can listen to you, can understand you, and will deliberate your um, case thoughtfully, carefully, and without prejudice. So uh, the media, I think, overall for this election has been quite good. 
Um, I, there's another excellent I mean, just, question. Can I add just one me. thing? Can I just add Judge one thing? Hill. Yeah, I, I'm very grateful that the media uh, appears to understand what judicial independence is. Uh, a lot of people think when you say, you know, judges should be independent, they think that's just judges circling the wag and protecting each other. When judicial independence means judges will focus on what happens in the courtroom and not be influenced by the mob not be influenced by putting their finger to the wind to decide how to decide cases. And the reason I raise this is because during in 2018, when there was the recall of Aaron Persky, there was an editorial in a major newspaper in the South Bay. And in the op-ed, it said something like this, I'm coming pretty close to the quote, uh, as for judicial independence, that ship has sailed. Stunning comment in an op-ed about judicial independence. Uh, and thankfully, I have not seen that in the media or in the press with regard to what's happening in San Francisco. Uh, so the key, again, it's so important for everyone to understand you want judges who are independent, meaning they're not going to be influenced by uh, people yelling and shouting at them or worried about the fact that they might lose their job because the decision they're about to make while it's the right one, it might be controversial, but it's the right thing to do. Those are the kind of judges we want. Uh, could you just expand on that? Because I, I, there's another uh, question in the Q&A that maybe we're being paternalistic when we're saying to everybody, here are the proper things you look for in a judge and here are the improper things maybe to look for. But why is it so important, Judge Cordell, to have independence? Why is, why is that even a value? Sure. There, there are three legs that support our democracy. We have the executive branch, the legislative, and the judicial. If any of those legs gets pulled out, we lose our democracy. And what's happening now in America is that judges are under attack. Federal state judges are under attack for not for making decisions that people who are yelling and hollering don't like. And what we don't want are judges who are reacting to what they're hearing out there, the yelling and the hollering. Thank you for putting up the, uh, the slide there. Uh, that's what we don't want. Think of it. If you had a case in court and a judge listened to everything carefully and was about to make a decision solely based on the evidence, and then the judge said, well, wait a minute, uh, I, I need to go check to see what... Uh, what you know? What I'm hearing out there, and I'm really concerned. If I make this decision, I know it's right that I could lose my job. That's what we don't want. So this isn't being paternalistic. It isn't being simplistic. Judicial independence is the key to a democracy, and it's what everyone should want. And when we no longer care about that, then you can forget about democracy entirely. So that's what we're fighting for. Uh, when judges are attacked just because they are of color or they don't have the right last name, we have a problem. We want judges thoroughly vetted and we want them to do their work. That's why we have a commission on judicial performance to ensure that we're getting people who are doing their jobs and doing it the correct way. We also hold judges accountable by going to the appellate courts, just as Jackson has explained. The judge has made a bad decision or wrong one. That's why we have appellate courts. So there are all kinds of ways we hold our judges accountable. What we don't hold them accountable, the way we don't, is by having them listening to the mob and responding to the mob instead of focusing on what's happening in the courtroom. The key is judicial independence. Can, can I add one thing to what Judge Cordell just said? This election sends a message. If these candidates are elected, it sends a message to all the sitting judges. Hey, listen, you're, don't be judicially independent because if you are, your job may be taken from you. It is so dangerous to threaten the judiciary on its independence based on the challenges of slogans like be tough on crime. Um, these slogans really not only threaten the candidates that are being challenged today, but it is threatening the entire judiciary's work because it's challenging the independence of the judiciary and makes the sitting judges worry that if they are successful, my goodness, the message goes out. Do I have to worry about politics? Do I have to worry about 
I'm being blamed for the crimes in San Francisco. Do I have to be tough on crime or appear to be tough on crime? It is a very dangerous signal that's giving out not only to these candidates, the, the judges who are being challenged, but to the entire judiciary's principle of independence. I'd like to just Thank say you, there are some questions in the Q&A expressing, you know, sort of frustration or sort of questioning about how do I find out about these candidates? And I share that, you know, when I was a lawyer, I didn't know who to vote for as a judge unless I'd appeared in front of that judge. So one of the questions is, where do we look to for guidance? And I apologize because I, I don't feel that and we are trying to be paternalistic at all because I, I don't like when that happens to me. But I would suggest that people look at the various news outlets. Of course, there's all sorts of different news outlets. So look at multiple ones and the ones that that you know, the voter trust. And I think it's just wonderful that the Bar Association of San Francisco does look at people's qualifications and vet. And the League of Women Voters also is in pretty much every community. I know there's one coming up in Santa Clara about our judicial elections here. I think those entities are ones that provide information and, and such that people can vote with some confidence. If I can just say one little thing, I know I talk a long time, but Judicial independence. I am here because in 1954, nine justices did not look at what the political tide was going on. Segregation was accepted by everyone in the in United States. And it was nine judges who said segregation is wrong. And that was the case of Brown versus Board of Education. That is showing independence that these judges did not make their decision based upon what was popular at the time, but what was right. And I often say, the reason I'm sitting here is because of that. And that's what you want in your judges. Thank you. Um, I, so folks have, have asked in, in this, the Q&A where to get more information um, and judge you and, and everybody. I think this has been an extremely informative panel. Uh, the Bar Association uh, has many resources. We put out a voter guide the League of Women Voters San Francisco puts out a voter guide. And on our website, which we'll see in the last slide, we have the ratings that we handed out to the two sitting judges who uh, participated in our vetting process, and we were unable to rate the uh, two challengers. Um, I think we're almost at time. Um, one final note is the effect of money in politics and the effect of money in a judicial race, having to raise money uh, as a sitting judge is very challenging and has its own implications for judicial independence. But I think we're at time and I'm going to hand it back to uh, Michelle and Danielle to close. And from, from my uh, point of view, I want to thank you for a very lively debate and it was very informative. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, I just wanna show one fi final slide with all sorts of resources. Um, let me find that. Okay, I hope everyone can see that. Um, so yes, most uh, uh, th thank you to all the judges. I think we could have gone on talking for another hour at least. And it was just, I learned so much. Um, thank you so much for participating in this. And also thank you to the audience who attended. Um, so Please remember to register to vote by February 20th, and you can do that online. All of these links on this slide should be live. Um, and uh, um, you can find pro-con guides and voter resource pages, both on the League of Women Voters website and the SF Bar website. Um, and uh, I also would like to point you in the direction of the American Constitution Society's website that has many, many resources. And finally, a plug um, to be a poll worker. The San Francisco Department of Elections is really in need of people to um, work in the polls on election day. And uh, you can click on this link or you scan the QR code to um, apply for that. And you do get paid for it as well. It's like around $250 to $300 for the day. So um, in closing, uh, thank you so much and please vote. And uh, this 
Uh, we recorded this. It will be live in a few days on our, um, or the recording will be shown in a few days on YouTube on our LWVSF and SFGov TV web um, YouTube channel. Thank you.